Hello, everybody. Hello, YouTube. Hello, art history enthusiasts and visual culture aficionados. It's me again, Ms. M. And I'm back with yet another video. Uh, today, no, I'm not done with understanding The Shining Part 17. I'm working on it. So, be cool. Um, but <laughs> I'm coming back with another video. I did one yesterday. Oh, yeah, here it is. Uh, Codex Kubrickianus. <laughs> That's my title for this one. And I don't know why I put two colons in the title, but I'm going to have to fix it. But I'm back, y'all. I'm back with uh, yet another video. Today, yes, it's going to be Shining related. You best believe is going to be Shining related. I'm working on some more stuff. Um, you know how I've been doing these uh, painting videos? This last, latest one is Hieronymus Bosch. And I mentioned David Lynch in the Hieronymus Bosch one. And I mentioned that I'm going to be talking about David Lynch's work in one of these paintings. I found this awesome uh, gallery that he is represented by here in the Southland. But I'll, they also have an outpost in New York, too. I'm going to be doing um, one of these here. They have the cute little biography about him and his sculptures and his paintings and whatever. I'm not going to put this in the description today, but, you know, just kind of um, getting you ready for the next one. I might also make an analysis of one of these paintings of his represented by the Pace Gallery, um, part of like an upcoming video I'm doing. I told you I'm going to try and debunk the debunkers. And I'm going to, uh, David is going to help me. <laughs> David is Lynch is going to help me um, fight ignorance. <laughs> yep. Yep. And, and, you know, I'm going to say thank you to David ahead of time because um, he's going to help me a lot. I'm sick and tired of people telling me that I can't think. You know, and maybe they're not telling me directly, but they're telling me indirectly in their own special uh, obnoxious little way. And I'm sick of it. I am fucking sick of it. Uh, but anyway, on a more pleasant note, let me do the church announcements and get that out the way so we could get into what I want to show you in this video. I'm going to read to you. So if you want to know whether or not you need to prepare, yes, prepare. Get yourself a nice place to sit or lie down. Get something nice to drink. Um, a snack. Whatever. Whatever makes you happy. You know, some, some indulge in whatever it is that you indulge in uh, to relax. So, <clears throat> um, oh yeah, church announcements. Uh, returning viewers, thank you for returning. New viewers, thank you for being new. Subscribers, all 560 of you, 12 of you subscribed since last night when I made this video. Uh, thank you so much. You guys mean everything to me as far as like my little endeavor here on YouTube. And I'm so happy that you're here. I'm so happy that you want to listen and, and hear what I have to say. Um, it is an honor. It is an honor to to ha have, have you all subscribe for whatever reason each and every one of you individually have done so. You know, it's an honor. Thank you. Um, and again, I'm, I, we're on the march towards one one thousand. Let's keep it. Let's keep it pumping. Let's go, y'all. Let get me monetized so I can afford gasoline and eggs. <laughs> gasoline, eggs. What else do I want to buy? <laughs> Some nice coffee. That would be nice. That would be. That would be cool. Like. <laughs> Or maybe I could afford to eat at McDonald's every now and again. <laughs> that would be awesome. But <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I just can't. I, if you knew, y'all, I know a lot of you, like some of you might live in Southern California. I know at least one of you does. Um, but like if you're in other parts of the country where gasoline does, you don't have to take out a loan to, to fill up the tank. <laughs> It's five dollars a gallon. Okay, and that's the cheap one. All right, that's the cheap one. Five dollars a gallon. Oh, it's painful to go put gas in the car. It's I only go to the grocery store once a week now. I used to go like every other day, you know, uh, when we were having our little Sanka discussion. Now it's like, oh, no, I'm going once a week. I'm going to get everything I need once a week. 
And I'm not going back until next week. Because the shit is expensive. Ay ay ay. Ay 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 ay. Like, forget steak. Forget, like, you know, good stuff. I got, uh, y'all, I, I went to the supermarket and I got, uh, I got some pork chops. Four really nice thick pork chops for, it, they were on sale for like 10 bucks, 10, 11 dollars. So there are some good deals out there. You just got to be, you know, on the lookout. Anyway, never mind all that. Um, Y'all, please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share the video. If you know somebody who might like me or my nonsense, uh, please spread the word. And that's that. Uh, and also, once again, uh, I'm I'm now in the partner program. If you want to leave me a tip in the in the tip jar, feel free. Uh, you know, and I again, I have plans. I want to do. You know, my blog that's currently up, that thing's a piece of shit. I need to, I need to get a new one, something that's easily accessible for me, something I can use. And I'm, I'm going to work on that within the next mm, month or so. Look out for a new one. I'll announce it in the video when I, when I finally get everything up and running. Um, you know, and, and I'll just see how that goes. I, I want to do that. And, I've got like I've got some stuff in the works, some st stuff that I want to do. So uh, here we are again, y'all. And once again, in in a couple of days, David, we're on a first name basis. Uh, David and me, uh, we're gonna we're gonna debunk the debunkers. Uh, you best believe, trust and believe. We're gonna debunk. The, I'm sick and tired of the thought police. I am sick and tired of people telling other people like don't don't think the only thing you can think is what i tell you to think no god damn it that's not how it works not for the shining not for stanley kubrick movies not for david lynch movies not for art not none of that okay none of that so but today i um you know what i have noticed in my uh travels with regard to well internet travels with regard to like being I don't even think I'm a part of the of the Kubrick an analysis community. Um, I don't think they would have me because, you know, I do entertain the ideas that are present in the Wendy theory. I've been critical of it before. Yes, I have, because, you know, I, I made a lot of assumptions that maybe I shouldn't have. But, <clears throat> you know, I've been seeing a lot stuff like a lot of people a lot of stuff where people just flatly um reject it and they don't even have really good reasons for doing it and that's what david's going to help me talk about next time too um, but i also have noticed that there are not a lot of women in the shining analysis community at least not that i can see maybe there are and they like their screen names or whatever just don't reflect their gender and that's fine. That's no problem with that. But I, I mean, the people who are the most vocal about this are men. Again, nothing wrong with that. But there, it just seems to me that not a lot of women are kind of into this or try to contribute in whatever way to the discussion. And then I found this. This is uh, one of the um, links listed. Like if you go to the Reddit and you go to the I think it's is the either the Stanley Kubrick or the Shining subreddit or maybe both. You'll find some of this person's links and I assume this is a female person, Julie. And this is her website or one page on her website, Idilopus Press. Okay, maybe you've seen it before. Maybe you don't even need me to show this to you. But I found this not because I clicked on the Reddit link. No, because I was looking for maps of the Overlook Hotel the interiors and this is her um page on that Sh stanley kubrick's the shining maps of the overlook and this is gold y'all this is pure gold the lobby the gold room the colorado lounge room 237 and its floor above the Colorado Lounge, and I was talking about that in one of my videos, trying to orient myself when I was going through that part of the movie where, where Danny um, passes by room 237 in that one scene. The staff wing, upper floors of the staff wing, the kitchen, the gold room, and the lobby. 
interesting look at look at how they are in relation to one another and now if these maps are accurate who shit okay this is this is this is i'm gonna use this i'm gonna i'm gonna refer back to this and every time every single time i refer back to this julie's gonna get her her flowers okay julie's gonna get her props because julie is the one who did this and committed this to this web page so we can all enjoy it and learn from it and benefit from it so if I, I doubt she's listening i doubt she's even aware of who i am and that's perfectly okay but you know thank you julie kearns for doing all of this and i i was poking around this website because it's interesting it's a really good website uh it'll it'll oh i oof. let me try and pronounce this properly Italopus press this is a good website i'm going to leave links in the description so you know so you can you can look at this if you want to in your own time and i was poking around julie's website <clears throat> and i found this marvelous um essay i think done by julie herself if i'm not mistaken um so here's this it's it's this page uh and i'll link it in the description uh the real horror of the shining the misogyny of the audience for wendy torrance and i'm going to read this to you because i want everybody to hear it now i haven't read this thing all the way through i've skimmed it and it looked good so i'm gonna um go through the whole thing paragraph by paragraph and of course i'll be uh i'll be pausing to add my reactions my impressions my observations my whatever uh, i don't know you know like i said i just skimmed it but i don't really know what i'm in store for when i when i get to reading this for real for real so we shall see i might agree with everything that's in this essay i might agree with nothing or i might agree with some stuff and not agree with other stuff but we shall see so again get comfortable get your drink get your snacks Get whatever it is that you, you enjoy when you're listening to one of my nonsense videos. And let's get to it. I'm going to go have a little coffee break now and, you know, wet my whistle so I can get ready to read this whole thing <laughs> to you. Okay, so like I said, when I get back, we'll get into it. So I'll be right back. All right, I'm back. Um, Had my little coffee. Uh, Now you guys you could probably figure out if you've been if looking at any of my other videos like why this essay by julie kearns caught my eye because of sneezy's comments regarding stanley and his choice of shelley duvall and his direction of shelley duvall in the movie that we're all obsessed with if you're on my channel you must be uh the shining okay <clears throat> so let me just get into it um and we'll we'll just like see what happens right so the real horror of the shining the misogyny of the audience for wendy torrance by julie kearns so it says under this picture go to the table of contents of contents of the analysis which also has a statement of purpose a statement on purpose and manner of analysis and a disclaimer as to caveat emptor and my knowing anything authoritatively which i do not but i do try to not know uh, i do try to not know earnestly with some discretion and considerable thought okay so preliminaries this is uh, are these quotes it looks like they're quotes from other sources uh the first one it has been only about 40 years since our country finally began to take notice of what is happening behind closed doors in 1978 the united states formed the national coalition against domestic violence along with the first battered women's program operating in north carolina uh, by the early 1980s, statistics proved that isolated cases of abuse were part of a shocking national problem. <clears throat> as a result, victims became more visible, as well as the inadequacy of society's response. The battered women's movement emerged, becoming one of the most powerful social justice and service movements in United States history. And this is by 
um, the website is sinbysilence.com. The next quote, uh, we talked for one month before we wrote anything at all. Stanley uses the Socratic method. Is the husband a nice man? Question mark. Does his l wife love him? Question mark. What kind of clothes would she wear? Question mark. Uh, that's from Diane Johnson, the writer of the Shining screenplay with Kubrick. Uh, here's another quote from Variety. From Variety, December 31st, 1979. Shelley Duvall transforms the warm, sympathetic wife of the book into a simpering, semi-retarded hysteric. <clears throat> okay. Um, that's what Variety said in 1979. Here's the next one by Jason Serafino, 2012. Shelley, du Shelley Duvall is just so whiny and dense as increasingly unstable Jack Torrance's wife that it makes it nearly impossible not to root for him to turn her into a lampshade for the hotel lobby. Oh, Lord. Her high-pitched speaking voice and shrieks just add fuel to our rage. Lampshade. Wow. That's a little too much. But let me just keep reading. Whew. Now I know why, why Julie felt compelled to write this essay. Okay. Kubrick's Wendy versus the Wendy of so many's desire, exploring the hidden misogyny of the audience. I don't know what she's going to write here, really, but let's see what let's see what Julie writes. So many years since 1980, but I don't believe I'm relying on faulty memory when I say that the portrayal of Wendy by Shelley Duvall under the direction of Kubrick was not happily received by many. She was perceived as irritating ineffectual, even ripe for abuse. She was not what people were expecting, whether they had read King's The Shining or not. And though Shelley had gained an appreciative audience, there are many who still perceive her Wendy with the same disdain. Uh, let me let me break right here. I've shown this movie to groups of people that I was in charge of, right? I, it was me doing it. I, I said, let's watch The Shining. And we would watch, and this is the method that I would use. Um, I would, I would say, let's just watch it, and it's not going to be. We're not going to watch this for fun. If you want to watch it for fun, you could do that at home. Go get you a copy of it at home and watch it all the way through. Here, we're going to pause and pause and pause. And you know, one of the people that I was showing it to in one of the groups said, "I'm John Maddening the movie," which I'm, I'm totally cool with. Um, and the audience reaction was one of the things that I wanted to gauge. I wanted to see, like, how the audience would react to this. Um, and these, I, w I won't tell you, like, what kind of group of people I was showing this to, <clears throat> but most of them were sympathetic to Wendy. The ones who spoke up, the ones who offered their observations, their opinion, whatever. Just, so just there's the that's from my own personal experience <clears throat> the audiences that i have shown this to and we've discussed it and we've analyzed it they were sympathetic to the wendy character okay so let me keep moving uh even i who had already seen and loved shelley in altman's brewster mcleod mccabe and mrs miller nashville and three women as well as alan's annie hall was at moments somewhat taken aback by Wendy as I watched her from my theater seat in 1980. But the reason I was discomfited hadn't to do with Shelley but the plot, that this woman would have submitted her son and herself to the clearly dangerous proposition of living in complete isolation with Jack, a discomfort and trepidation that the doctor's interview with Wendy was intended to make us feel. Of course, I knew the plot was based on the Stephen King book, though I didn't know how closely Kubrick might have followed it. I hadn't read the novel yet, and wouldn't do so for another few years. However, being very attuned to the nature of abuse, I was furious with Wendy for her decision to follow Jack to the Overlook. My immediate emotional and personal response was fear and fury for the child, followed by concern for Wendy. When she reassured Danny that everything would be just fine at the lodge, 
my mind and nervous system wholly rebelled. Protect your child! It was impossible for me to laugh in amusement at the contrary foreshadowing of doom. Then, sometime during the watching of the film, I was won over by Shelley's portrayal of the, abu of the abused, her uncertain reality, her fear and acute awareness, that she should take great care with how she moves, lest she bring on an immediate physical attack before she is in a position where she won't be overcome. Flight and fight held in tenuous balance. Shelley was impeccable in the scene in which she tells Jack she wants to take Danny down the mountain, and he explodes at her. She was amazing in the Colorado lounge scene, glancing left and right, always moving backward because she knows she dares not turn and attempt to run, for if she does, she will be brought down by Jack in a heartbeat, watching for when she is in the exact right place to strike Jack with the bat. Never mind the problem of the woman in the bathtub or the ghost in the ballroom. Here was the horror, and it was spot on. In 1980, I interpreted the true horror as being in the abuse, having over some years done a deep study and cross-analysis of all Kub Kubrick's films, aware of Kubrick's intentional blurring of the boundaries between the stage and the audience and its accomplishment by various means, bluntly approached in The Clockwork Orange, but already evident in Fear and Desire, with its tie to The Tempest, in The Killing, with its tie to Pagliacci, in Killer's Kiss, with its tie to Himbarama, all examples of the play within the play and the breaking of the fourth wall. I now look to the role of the audience in The Shining and it's not unlike the final scene of the soldier audience in the cafe in Paths of Glory. We have been primed to be wholly sympathetic with the men, as we have been educated on their manipulation by the elite. We are with them, one of them. Now, however, in the cafe, when they are promised an exhibit of the newest acquisition of the enemy, and onto the stage is push-pulled a woman who is, quote-unquote, the enemy, the various faces of their raucous re reception is mediated upon with some disdain and resignation by Kirk Douglas, his reaction signaling us that this is not right, that we n must now be at odds with the men with whom we had sympathized, that we should take Douglas's cue and separate ourselves from their laughter, as the cafe owner points out to the soldiers that sh the frightened woman has, quote, absolutely no talent at all except for maybe a little natural talent, end quote. He echoed her figure's curves with his hand. She can't dance. She can't tell jokes. She can't balance rubber balls on her nose. But when she begins to sing, tears streaming down her face, uh, the faithful hussar, the men are silenced and cry along. Wow. Ay, ay, ay. I need to watch this movie. I need to watch Paths of Glory. Uh, <clears throat> Shelley Duvall's Wendy, for many in the audience, is, quote-unquote, the enemy, without their being at all cognizant of the fact. Mm, this is interesting. Uh, to understand the how and why is to examine one of the trickier aspects of the film in its exposure of the hatred of too many for her, the female, a victim, a survivor, and the enemy. Unlike Paths of Glory, we don't have a Kirk Douglas letting the audience know when their response betrays hostile sexism and contempt for her vulnerability, not even as a feminine trait, but vulnerability in general, even their own. Whereas the soldiers respond to the German woman's tearful song of love and loss, the audience in The Shining is not scripted. How will they respond to Wendy when left to their own devices? Now... Y'all, um, you know that I, this is, this is me, Miss Sam talking, you know that I look at the Wendy character a little bit differently than maybe the majority of Shining analyzers do. I don't necessarily think of her as a victim, mm, because I question the perspectives that we are shown in the movie. And I'm not sure, like, from whose 
perspective this story is being told in The Shining. I can't be sure. Is it from Jack's perspective or Wendy's perspective or Danny's perspective? Or, or this is kind of where I'm at right now, Stanley Kubrick's perspective. He's the omniscient one, right? And like I said, I've, I've, I've explained a little bit about why I feel that way in one of my videos. I think that the beige typewriter in the Colorado lounge when the Jack character is bouncing the tennis ball off the walls, I think the beige typewriter that we never see again, later it's black or dark gray, um, the beige typewriter is Stanley. That cigarette that's lit and resting in the ashtray, that's Stanley's cigarette. He's watching the Jack character act a fool in the Colorado lounge. So I don't know who the victim is in The Shining. Is it Wendy? Is it Jack? Is it Danny? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I don't think of Wendy as a victim. I don't know if I think of Jack as a victim either. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not yet sure of, about that aspect. Um, because I don't know whether or not either of them are without sin, so to speak. Okay. But let me keep it going with this essay. So how, how will the audience, how will they respond to Wendy when left to their own, own devices? Okay. Uh, Shelley Duvall's role in The Shining has been stated by Stephen King to be quote unquote misogynistic. Here's a quote from, I think, Stephen King. Shelley Duvall as Wendy is really one of the most misogynistic characters ever put on film. She's basically just there to scream and be stupid. And that's not the woman that I wrote about. And I've, I've read this quote before in my other videos. Uh, here's another one. Uh, Stephen King describes Shelley as Wendy as a screaming dish rag. And it's, and it's so misogynistic. I mean, Wendy Torrance is just presented as this sort of screaming dish rag. <laughs> and you know how I feel about sneezing. You know how I feel about sneezing. Uh, anyway, uh, King wanted a glamorous blonde. This is Julie again. King wanted a glamorous blonde. We know this as for his miniseries, he opted for Rebecca de Mornay. He wanted Wendy to be sexually alluring and powerful. And one has to wonder how the audience would have responded to such a presence as Wendy in Kubrick's film. Interpreting beauty and sexiness as power through being worthy of desire, what would have been their response to the woman who desired and was desirable, who part of the audience wants in their arms and the other part would want to emulate as a fantasy ideal? This is a good question that Julie Kearns is asking here, which is really a question about like, why did Stanley Kubrick choose Shelley Duvall? And it's not like Shelley Duvall was this frumpy, like, you know, girl next door kind of actress. She was the it girl of her day in the late 1970s. Like it, earlier in this essay, uh, Julie Kearns lists like a couple of the movies that she was in. And those were all like, pretty popular movies at the time. Uh, she was in high demand as an actress. She was dating Paul Simon. Then later, after she broke up with him, she was dating Ringo Starr. Um, Ringo Starr from the Beatles. Okay. I don't know who I... Would I compare her to, like... Who would I compare her to that, like, in the modern world, uh, as far as her it girl status at the time... I don't know if like Margot Robbie or or some somebody like that, but like not just an actress, who, maybe like a Meryl Streep. But then again, that was the same generation, Meryl Streep and Shelley Duvall. But like she was just, you know, she was a model. She was known for her good looks. She was thin. She was tall. Um, she has, you know, good proportions. She had that face that kind of looks good with everything. Um Outside of The Shining, she didn't look like that. They made her look like that for that movie. Kubrick and whoever, like the costume people, the makeup people, the hair people, made Shelley Duvall look like, you know, the way Wendy Torrance looks in the movie. And they did that for a reason. She was chosen for a reason to portray 
uh, that character because she has a certain look to her and they manipulated that and if you look at like the the interviews that she did when she was doing the shining outside out of character dressed in her own clothes and whatever she was freaking pretty Shelley Duvall was pretty I'm talking about at the time she was very very pretty a lot of women to this day would probably you know go go be very happy if they looked like her now De Rebecca de Mornay or like this blonde bombshell kind of thing this is Stephen King's vision this is the kind of wife that he thinks that his Jack character or John uh, Torrance character would have and the question is why I mean the question is why in the book the Jack character is a complete piece of shit in my opinion He's just not that no redeeming qualities whatsoever in the book. In the movie, Stanley like messes with that too. But like the book version of Jack Torrance, like if this woman is supposed to be a prize, like what did Jack Torrance in the book do to deserve that prize, to deserve a trophy wife? He's like, you know. He, he's a barely making ends meet English teacher who ends up beating one of his students almost to death and has to move halfway across the country to avoid the fallout of that kind of behavior. Like, yeah, that's a real winner. If she's the prize. Now, this, if any, I mean, based on what I'm, what I'm getting from this, if anybody's the misogynist between... Uh, Kubrick and Stephen King it's Stephen King it's Stephen King not Stanley Kubrick Stanley Kubrick is being real and in Paths of Glory that she was talking about a paragraph or so ago who did Stanley Kubrick cast as the woman who sings that song in tears at the end of Paths of Glory his wife Christiane I mean, I don't know if they were married at the time, but we know that they did get married and they lived happily ever after. So he cast the woman that he found personally very attractive and so much so that he wanted to marry her. It was she, he put her in that position to provide a, a really serious thing to question the audience in the movie and their reaction to her being up there singing and our reaction according to Julie and the way she um, describes this, he put Christiane. And now in the Wendy character, he's putting Shelley, Shelley Duvall and made her look frumpy and dumpy and, you know, the, those, those smock dresses and whatever. Not at all glamorous. No. But why did he do that? Why did he choose Wendy Torrance? I'm um, not Wendy Torrance, but why did he choose Shelley Duvall and and make her look like that with those clothes and that hair and whatever in The Shining? That we got to question that. We got those are uncomfortable questions, but we have to ask them and be honest when we try to answer them. Okay, because there's something going on. Julie's on to something in this essay. Um, anyway, so Stephen King said, yeah, she's just to, uh, just to scream and be stupid. Uh, she's a dish rag. Okay, so here comes Julie again. King wanted a glamorous blonde. We know this. Uh, da, 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 yeah, I think I read that already. Um, uh, who part of the audience wants in their arms and the other part would want to emulate as a fantasy ideal. Okay. All right. Um, Kubrick had to say of his Wendy, oh, I can't read to, wait to read this. I had seen all of Shelley Duvall's films and greatly admired her work. Okay, period. Full stop. These are Stanley Kubrick's words. So anybody who says that he abused Shelley Duvall, this is what he has to say about her. He had seen all of her films and greatly admired her work. Okay, that's not what somebody says who doesn't respect someone. I'm just saying. Uh, here he, he continues. I think she brought an instantly 
believable characterization to her part. Yep. Uh, the novel pictures her as much more self-reliant, as a much more self-reliant and attractive woman. But these qualities make you wonder, haha, <laughs> why she has put up with Jack for so long. Shelley seemed to be exactly the kind of woman that would marry Jack and be stuck with him. The wonderful thing about Shelley is her eccentric quality. Is he wrong? Is Stanley Kubrick wrong about that? And I mean, he's saying something not just about his Wendy, his when the Wendy character, the way he did it. He's also, at the same time, without saying it, saying something about Stephen King's as Wendy character. Like Stephen King is is his 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 mind is complete. If the once again, if he's the one who wrote the book. Um, his mind is completely warped. Why would a trophy wife stay with somebody like Jack? Kind of like what I just said. What did Jack do to deserve that trophy? Nothing. He's a loser. He's a loser. He's he's crazy. He's a, a an abusive, uh, narcissistic, alcoholic um, who can't get his shit together. Like, yeah, a trophy wife would gravitate towards somebody like that are you serious okay um anyway moving on uh his remarks now this is julie talking about what stanley had to say his remarks seem to me somewhat facile and contrary to his film but i expect that of kubrick in his interviews in if one examines kubrick's telling of king's tale it isn't exactly that his conception of Wendy was more realistic, for classically beautiful women such as Rebecca are abused. Again, look at look to paths of glory and fear and desire for the misogynistic treatment of women, the enemy, for who in those two films were classically attractive and had obvious natural talents, quote unquote, that didn't save them. She's making a good point. Um, in wartime, women are seized and raped by conquering forces, the heroes, old women and young, no, women no matter their experience, uh, even women who welcome friendly forces as their rescuers. Kubrick explicitly states such violence in Barry Lyndon and Barry's horror of it. No, something else is going on with Kubrick's Wendy, who was undeniably a heroic character, and it hasn't to do with any idea of her being more realistic, not a Rebecca de Mornay. I don't know about this. Yeah, beautiful women get treated very badly, too, just sometimes because they're beautiful. Right? I know, like, most women want to look like models and actresses and whatever, but... Those women get treated really, really badly. Just like their beauty does not protect them from being mistreated. And it might give them like a head start in some areas. Maybe it's easier to, you know, uh, you know, maybe it's easier for them to do well or, or have advancements in some areas of life. But if they're, if they're being picked, unfairly because they're beautiful then that comes along with a whole uh, its own set of um this like not disadvantages but they're going to have to pay for that if 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 they get a head start or they get preferential treatment because of their looks and you know everybody's jealous of them or other women are jealous of them because they get picked simply due to their good looks what they don't understand is that woman got picked for her good looks like in a hiring um situation at a job or whatever so the person who's hiring her if he's hiring her or she sometimes um is hiring that woman based on the fact that she's beautiful she's going to get hit on a lot she's going to get a lot of unwanted attention at that job she's going to be the topic of gossip like the men are going to do locker room talk about her and the women are going to gossip about her and say that she's just sleeping with everybody or and or the boss is gonna just expect her to go to quote-unquote dinner with him or you know that kind of thing 
So, yeah, this is a really good point that Julie's making. Um, again, everybody thinks that beauty is this wonderful thing. If you're a beautiful person, whether you're male or female, that's just that get, that gives you all kinds of advantages in life. And I suppose it does in one way, but in another way, you got to pay for those advantages. You no, no, There's no such thing as a free lunch ever, ever. But let's let's keep it moving. Um, <laughs> did I read this? Yes. So what is going on? This is Julie. So what is going on when I say that it wasn't a matter of Kubrick's Wendy being more realistic in appearance than the blonde beauty, in as much as she didn't possess the classical and stereotypical beauty of a Rebecca de Mornay? Not that Shelley Duvall isn't also a beautiful woman. Vivian Kubrick's The Making of the Shining clearly showed us that she is, and I believe this display of her rather ethereal beauty was intentionally done to highlight the contrast between Shelley and Shelley's Wendy. Like, as you can see in this photo, like, her hair is perfect. Her skin is perfect. Her makeup, and I know she's wearing makeup, like, those of you who think that this is a natural look, think again. Um, it's perfect. Her face is perfect. Her complexion is perfect. The, her facial proportions are more or less perfect. She's a pretty lady. Yeah, she has those teeth, but whatever. She's a pretty lady. So this isn't, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a matter of costume and hair and makeup and, and lighting and angles, camera angles. That's why Wendy looks the way Wendy looks in The Shining. Um, you know, they didn't have filters back then. They didn't have Instagram filters. But anybody, just about anybody, could look great on film or horrible on film, depending on who it is that's taking the photos or the lighting conditions or whatever. But let's keep it moving. Um, yeah. Uh, instead of giving the audience the stereotypically beautiful uh, heroine in that that the public and King wanted... The women whose power and value are dictated by not only her beauty, but her desire to be desired, uh, parlaying her beauty and sexiness in a bid for value and thus power, which is its own brand of submissive submissiveness and a false power that affords no protection against sexism and misogyny and violence. Kubrick gave us in Wendy, a woman who didn't give a rat's ass if her audience wanted to fuck her. Uh, that is what was damn near unforgivable. What Kubrick was doing was giving the audience what would bring out their own hidden misogyny. Wait a minute. What in the world did I just read? Hold on. <laughs> so is Julie saying that presenting the Wendy that we saw in the movie, the less than you know, the less than um, perfect looking woman? Is is she saying that Stanley made her look frumpy because then the audience would, that, that would, that would, that would make the audience root for Jack because she's unattractive? Like, is that what this means? I'm trying to figure this out. This is like, this is all one sentence, by the way. Or no, not all, but there's two sentences in this paragraph. Like, the first one is very, very long. Um, oh, my. Instead of giving the audience the stereotypically beautiful heroine that the public and king wanted, uh, the woman whose power and value are dictated by not only her beauty but her desire to be desired, parlaying her beauty and sexiness in a bid for value and thus power, which is its own brand of submissiveness and a false power that affords no protection against sexism and misogyny and violence, Kubrick gave us in Wendy a woman who didn't give a rat's ass if her audience wanted to fuck her. This is an assumption. I see what Julia is saying here, but she's making an assumption about the Wendy character. She's saying that the Wendy character doesn't give a rat's ass if her audience, whether in the world of the movie or the movie audience, wants to sleep with her. I don't think that's true. Personally. 
I don't think that's true. I think that the Wendy character, and I told you how she, I think she's flirting with Stuart Oldman. So I don't, I don't agree with this. Um, and then she says, that is what was damn near forgivable. Why, why, why is this unforgivable? If this is the case, why is it unforgivable? What Kubrick was doing was giving the audience what would bring out their hidden misogyny. A woman who doesn't care whether or not people desire her sexually. Mm, I don't know. Like, maybe, I maybe, you know what? Maybe I don't know exactly how misogyny works because I'm not a misogynist and I'm, I am female, but, <laughs> um, that's not how I experience misogyny in my own life. Personally, I know every woman has her own stories to tell. Um, I, I don't know how to characterize this. I don't know how to explain this. Maybe one day I'll, I'll find the words, but let me just use one example. Um, and again, y'all, my regulars, if you're listening, um, my regular commenters, I mean, and it, people who interact in the comments, uh, I do these videos. Okay. I do not show my own likeness. I don't even use my own real name because I don't want, you know, the internet is what it is. I don't want some crazy person to be able to find me. Okay. I don't say what I do for a living. I, I leave little hints here and there, but I don't say flat out what I do for a living. I don't show my face. I don't sh tell you my real name. Um, you know, I, and I, I do these videos for the reason why I do these videos. I want to help people educate themselves. I'm not trying to educate you. I'm trying to like open a door for you or, 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 or present options for you in, in the way of educating yourself. Uh, and I get some real interesting comments. Some of them that have never been published because YouTube has deemed them inappropriate. And I deem them inappropriate too, but YouTube, like I put the thing like hold potentially inappropriate comments and it does, it does. Um, recently, again, I don't show my face or anything or say my name. One of my comments in under one of the videos was, uh, do you, when you do these podcasts, are you, are, uh, are you naked? when you do these videos, when you, when you do these podcasts that got filtered out automatically by YouTube. Thank you, YouTube. You did me a great favor, but like, that's one of the, I don't know if it was a, uh, a, a um, what do they call the spam commenter or a bot commenter or whatever. I don't know, like that kind of technical stuff, but that was creepy. That was creepy. Why leave a comment like that? Do men get those kind of comments? Once again, nobody can see me. It doesn't matter whether or not I'm attractive because you can't see me. But this person, I assume a man, I might be wrong, but I'm, I think it was a man. Are you naked when you're making these podcasts? Do you do your podcast in the nude? <sighs> That's gross and creepy. But what Julie is asking or saying here, what Kubrick was doing was giving the audience what would bring out their own hidden misogyny. Okay. All right. So misogyny is a hatred of women. And she's saying that Kubrick is testing his audience and seeing you know, he putting something that he believed, according to Julie, that he believed would bring out their own hidden misogyny. A lot of people, and by the way, I'm not a feminist. I've said this before. It bears repeating, especially in a discussion like this. I am not a feminist. But I don't believe in women getting mistreated for any reason. And the reason I'm not a feminist is because I was, I was talking to this about uh, talking about this to Luke and Dr. Dr. Luke and, um, 
Gershom. It's like Judge Judy said. If I do anything like in my life that's noteworthy, or like if I do something decent or good in my life, or make any kind of progress or achieve anything, I don't want anybody to say that I did that or I was able to do that simply because I'm female and somebody clear the, cleared the path for me because of affirmative action or God knows what. You know, somebody like held the door for me held the door open for me because I'm female. I don't want anybody to be able to say that about whatever it is that I'm doing. If I do something good, I want people to say that's good because Miss M did it, not because Miss M is a woman. Okay, so is Stanley Kubrick testing his audience? Does I think it's a it's it's a the, that's what I'm thinking, based on what Julie is writing here, is is Stanley Kubrick, gauging his audience to see, like. Who they are. In general, what and what will bring out their hidden misogyny. You know, sometimes the the people that I that are most guilty of being misogynistic, are the people who claim to be the biggest champions for women and that's both me that's both female and male people who say that they're trying to fight for the rights of women S those people are sometimes the worst misogynist but try and tell them that try and explain that to them no it's not going to work let me keep it moving uh building kubrick's wendy the audience's first experience of wendy is what shapes their experience for her of her, sorry, for the remainder of the film. Here's the picture of her on the phone with Jack. Um, Wendy in red, full body union suit underwear, and a floppy pinafore is not a starlet who is trying to seduce the audience and the camera into conferring upon her a false sense of value via that desire. Wendy in red, full body union suit underwear. And a floppy pinafore is not a woman who is measuring her worth on whether you find her desirable or not. Hmm. That's an assumption, but okay, let's roll with it. Uh, and I don't think it's what Wendy was so... Oh, yeah, yeah, wait a minute. And I don't think it's that Wendy was so beaten down that she didn't care how she looked, for she obviously does care. She typically dresses well, just not for overt sex appeal. Okay. Uh, this version of Wendy doesn't want the audience to want her. She's at home taking care of her young son. What she wears in the Boulder apartment scene was also a look I was very familiar with from back in the 1970s in certain circles of women who were going to do something different than give in to society's demands. They make themselves traditionally appealing. Hmm. I'm going to stop for a second. Um, women don't know what men like. I don't know why. We all, you know, we all expect men to only want models or, you know, attractive women from TV and movies, porn stars, strippers, we think that that is the only thing that men find attractive or sexy. That's, I'm, 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 this is my assessment of it. That's what women have been taught. You have to look like Cindy Crawford, or you have to look like Pamela Anderson, or Marilyn Monroe, or somebody like that, uh, you know, Eva Gardner, if you want to go back in time, or whatever. That's what men want. Sexy, revealing clothing, lots of makeup, high-heeled shoes, um, or tight form fitting clothing all the time. And so Julie's saying that this is, this is the look not meant to get that kind of attention. That's an assumption. You don't know what somebody's thinking when they're dressing themselves. That's, that's one thing. But again, we women, we don't know what men really like. I have seen men just fall madly head over heels in love with the most frumpiest looking women that I think are frumpy looking. I, and I, you know, attractive men, uh, getting together and ha living happily ever after with women that I would be like, 
very surprised. I'd be like, really? Her? Yeah, her. Um, and she wasn't showing off any skin. She wasn't wearing tight clothing. She wasn't wearing makeup or anything. But for some reason, that guy really liked her. Or there's there's women that, you know, they don't look like much. They dress like Wendy in this scene. Or, you know, they don't wear any makeup. Or, you know, you don't know what their body looks like because their their clothing would never, you can't see. They're, it's not form-fitting clothing the men like everywhere they go they get a lot of attention from men they wear basically shapeless stuff like this no makeup hair pulled back into a whatever kind of bun uh sneakers whatever and absolutely irresistible to men and you know a woman growing up in this society sees that and does it doesn't make sense I thought you were supposed to wear makeup. I thought you were supposed to get plastic surgery. I thought you were supposed to, um, you know, uh, be a certain way. No, we women really don't know what men like. I'm sure that a lot of men like um, porn stars and strippers and models and, you know, Sports Illustrated uh, sp spreads or whatever. But that's probably not the only thing that they like. We, we women underestimate men in so many different ways, partially because we're taught to. And like, who is it that teaches us to do that? I don't know. Is it society? Is it school? Is it TV? Is it movies? I mean, is there like a campaign to make sure that women don't have the tools that they need to uh, prepare themselves for the world and the world of men and the I don't maybe, but we don't know we don't really know what men like they like a lot more than what we're told that they like is that a discussion for another time i don't know but that that that's what that's why i stopped and said that because of this paragraph um no women who dress like this it's not that they don't care about how they look but they are trying to project something and maybe stanley kubrick understands this Per one particular part of it better than Julie or I ever could because he's a man <laughs> and he knows he's a man who's into women uh, and he knows what how men look at women I don't Julie doesn't Th I'll leave it at that um what else we got going on in this paragraph? Uh, ha, ha, ha. When it was cold, they wore the one-piece underwear. They wore the pinafores. They wore the exact same flat booties that Wendy has on, uh, unseen in the above shot. They didn't do, quote-unquote, do their hair, other than to wash and let dry. For those who think this makes a woman untouchable, believe it or not, they had sexual partners. But <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. Uh, see all those books sitting around Jack and Wendy's apartment? There were women who quite often put their energies into their intellect. They drew from a certain pool of partners do it, but that intellect didn't mean they couldn't end up with abusive partners. <sighs> okay. I won't, I won't challenge that part of it. That's fair enough. Okay. But society's demands like what no what we're taught is society's demands that women make themselves traditionally appealing um i'll leave it at that because i i could i could this could go all all kinds of wrong if i keep going um if audiences have a problem with shelley's sometimes otherworldly appearance and unsexy attire on the day when they arrive at the Overlook, she is every bit a 1980s version of an attractive, well-dressed, and even stylish woman. Sociable and appropriate in every way. She even wears makeup. She dresses well throughout the film just for the cold, because it's cold. Her makeup and hairstyle are not for a disco night out on the town, because she's not out on the town. She's taking care of the hotel and her family. Yeah, her outfit on... on when they arrive at the hotel on closing day, it's really interesting. She's trying to project a certain image, and she's trying to project a certain image uh, that will make her husband look good. Not necessarily make her look good, 
but to make Jack look good. That's why she's dressed the way she is on closing day. I'll leave it at that. That's my opinion. Okay, uh, moving on. Return for a moment to what Diane Johnson said of her time working with Kubrick on the characters. A full month before even tackling the script. Here's the quote. Uh, we talked for one month before we wrote anything at all. Stanley uses the Socratic method. Is the husband a nice man? Does his wife love him? What kind of clothes would she wear? End quote. Uh, we need to take this seriously. Wendy and Jack don't suddenly materialize out of thin air in Boulder. The film gives us no prior history but for the alcoholism, Danny's injury, and the fact that Jack's a writer and teaching school was a way of making ends meet. Okay. Uh, Wendy's clothing signals something about her and her reading material, as I've already suggested, and the fact that she so readily takes on the duties of the caretaker of the Overlook. Jack's a teacher and writer. What has drawn them together? What is it that Kubrick envisions as having drawn them together and making them stick? Perhaps that Wendy, a reader, appreciated Jack's desire to become an author, and Jack responded to that. Uh, we have no intellectual conversation between them, but these two have been through some rocky times. He's already distanced her, and they now have a son that they can considerably change the focus and demands of a marriage for the time, for a time, such as in what becomes the important focus of conversation when a child is young. They probably originally shared intellectual interests. They probably met in school. They probably were counterculture. They probably considered each other to be socially aware and awake to the injustices in the world. They had hopes and dreams, but when Danny was born, and that changed things. Uh, physically, we know from Jack's vision of the woman in the bathtub that if he does become a successful author, he might eventually dump Wendy and go for the overtly sexy blonde. That's an assumption. Uh, and, you know, it, again, the way I look at this movie, if Kubrick is basically showing you Stephen King, you know, the Jack character is really Stephen King and Kubrick's opinion of Stephen King, um... You know, Stephen King is still married to the to his first wife. And the sexy blonde in the bathtub. I mean mm, that is a questionable scene. And from whose perspective are we looking at that scene? Is it Jack's or is it Wendy's? I'm not sure. But anyway, let's keep it moving. Um that raises the question. With Wendy's competency in taking care of the Overlook on her own, if she was initially supporting Jack in his endeavors by working before Danny was born uh, or before he left school, well, Stephen King's wife worked at Dunkin' Donuts. Okay. While he was an English teacher. Just like the Jack in the novel. I'll keep it moving. Uh, many women work to put their husbands through school, and more than a few husbands left their wives when they got their master's or Ph.D. But let's go ahead and take for granted that Jack did love her at one time, in his own faulty way. Let's assume, for instance, that they also didn't decide to get married because Wendy had become pregnant, though the pregnancy might not have been planned. Let's assume that Jack wasn't pressured into make, marrying Wendy due a pregnancy for he had for ha oh dear for had for he oh yeah 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 hold on uh for he had he would certainly unleashed his rage when he claimed she and Danny are holding him back okay um Let's assume Jack's alcoholism and his character flaws and the responsibilities of parenthood have made him resentful and that, based on things he later says in the film, he's made Wendy a vessel for these failings and bitterness over the loss of youthful dreams. Hmm. Mm hmm. Perhaps he would prefer to not hate her, but his family represents all his failures now. Let's assume that Wendy didn't have a good picture 
of Jack's flaws when they married, and that though she does still love him, she also has her own wall that stands between them due to the alcoholism, due Danny's being injured, due at least emotional abuse she's suffered. She is also now a mother, and that has changed things. So we have Jack accusing her of caring about Danny, but not about him. He resents that maternal affection, feels alienated, and doesn't appreciate how he's alienated her, and, and that she and Danny are their own familial unit, now formed in response to his alcoholism and his irregular temperament. Mm-hmm. Wendy and Danny are the enemy, stealing his time and concentration. Wendy and Danny are the enemy, holding him back, but also reminding him of his failings in regard them. He is mistreatment of them, which he must rationalize. Hmm. Again, who's, who's narrating this story, The Shining, in the movie? Is it Jack or is it Wendy? And, like, how can we tell either way? Or is it Stanley? Is it Stanley? What's going on? So basically, what Laurie's saying here is that Wendy represents to Jack every in every every single way that he's failed in life. <sighs> okay. My question is like, what do we know about Wendy? Like, we know that Jack's an aspiring writer. We know he taught school, and what whatever, um, from the movie. But we don't know nothing about Wendy. We don't know, like, did she go to college? Did she ever have a job? Did she, um, you know, is Jack her first husband? Or, you know, like, we don't know none of that. We don't know how they got together. We don't know why they got together, why they got married. Nothing. We don't know nothing. We know a little bit about Jack. We know nothing about Wendy. From the movie, by that that's what I'm going by. Let me keep it moving. Uh, Kubrick shows us no deep history. That's true. Uh, instead, giving ed evidence of it in the present as consequence is to cause. So we have to pay a special attention to Wendy's attire, to their principal investment being in books and Danny's toys, rather than their hodgepodge furnishings. Kubrick shows us no deep history instead giving us Jack's alcoholism, Jack's bitterness and resentment, and very importantly, his accusations of Wendy's foremost concern being for Danny. Jack would prefer to be the center of Wendy's world. Mm, I don't know. Even if you, like, take the movie the way it's traditionally analyzed, like Jack is the violent, abusive one, and he's resentful of Wendy, and he, like she says here, Jack would prefer to be the center of Wendy's world. Um, not really. Not really. Um, Jack would prefer, again, in the traditional way, Jack would prefer for everything that Wendy does to be of some benefit to him. Now, whether or not Danny is involved in that is, um, irrelevant. Irrelevant. So the traditional reading of the Jack character in the movie, he's just incredibly selfish and narcissistic. Incredibly selfish and narcissistic. And none of his problems, he, he doesn't blame any of his problems on himself. It's always somebody else's fault. Um, and it doesn't matter who that somebody else is. It could be Wendy. It could be Danny. It could be the kid that he beat up uh, before they had to run away from, where were they, in um, Vermont, right? It's not his fault. It's that kid's fault for being somebody that he wanted to beat up or whatever it was, right? 
Um, let's keep it moving. Uh, Kubrick's Wendy didn't magically transform from a woman living in a twilight of doubt and deceit, harangued and abused, trying to hold things together, trying to protect her son as best she knows how, challenging Jack, gaslighted by Jack, so that she has no idea of her reality, into a superwoman wielder of audience-appeasing vengeance. Actually, she did. Wait a minute, what is this? In the movie? Yeah. She does magically transform. Kind of. Um, from this uh, abused, harangued uh, woman who's not sure of herself, trying to hold things together and whatnot. She did magically transform from that to... Um, in, into a superwoman, wielder of audience appeasing vengeance. Yes, she, 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 she did, because like something happens in the Colorado lounge scene that doesn't make sense because her when she like finally smacks Jack on the head with that baseball bat, that's not her turning into like you know, um, superwoman. That's her the way we see that scene that she's crying throughout the whole thing she doesn't try to confront him and be like okay like why did you sneak up on me like that what's wrong with me reading your uh, quote unquote novel like why 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 are you acting crazy jack like don't don't talk to me that way no she 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 when he when he sneaks up on her she she looks and acts guilty and he's pursuing her like in a zigzag kind of pattern through the Colorado lounge. And when she does smack him in the head with that baseball bat, it's not, it's not a thing where, um, she's like triumphant or she's finally showing that she has strength. No, she smacks him at a time when he's at his weakest. And she gets the upper hand by backing up those stairs, even though that's difficult to do. But when she's finally in a secure position at the top of the stairs and he's beneath her, like a couple stairs down um, and in a precarious position, that's when she smacks him. She can't smack him when they're downstairs, like on flat on the flat floor, because like, what if she misses or what if he grabs the bat or whatever, like when he's on the stairs? there's much less likelihood of him trying to fight back or him trying to dodge the swing of the bat. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it is magical because it happens in a way where we don't expect it as the audience. She's crying the whole way. We like, if you're watching that scene for the first time, you're like, you just don't expect her to gain the upper hand in any way, shape, or form. So it is kind of, maybe not magical, but abrupt. Um, this article continues, she didn't go out and learn martial arts and return and kill Bill, um, but reviewed the footage, even despite the fact she does thwack Jack over the head and lock him in the freezer. And what a tour de force that performance is for Wendy is a woman who, even as she defends herself and her son, she does not want to permanently injure or kill her husband. Uh, audiences, for some reason, could still refuse, and often enough still refuse to respond to the heroine in her, though she is the one who has been taking care of Danny, has been taking care of the Overlook, who has actually not been badgering Jack with whiny relentlessness, how she is often described as whiny. Mm. Again, I have my way of looking at this movie and I'm not discounting the way that Julie's looking at this because she's looking at this the way everybody always looks at this movie because they don't question what they're seeing, what they're seeing. They don't question whether or not what they're being shown in the movie is actual like reality within the world of the movie or a hallucination a hallucination on I don't know whose part, Jack's or Wendy's. I'm leaning towards Wendy, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure. So, like, okay. You know, we need to... 
I need to, uh, us, we need to like think about this for a little while. Like what's going on? What's going on? Um, the minute she believes Jack has abused Danny at the hotel, she turns protectively fierce in her defense of Danny. That lasts one second. She says, you did this to him, you son of a bitch, and then she carries Danny away. And that's about it. And then later, again, she's acting like a victim. Or like a guilty person when she's reading his novel. Uh, but then she has to sort out if Danny was injured by Jack or the quote-unquote crazy woman who Danny tells her about. Nobody ever questions the crazy woman or the woman in the in the bathtub in room 237. I mean, they don't, they don't ever think that either the crazy woman is Wendy or that the crazy woman is... Anything other than what was shown. They don't question, like, why Jack would go in there, have his encounter with the quote-unquote crazy lady, and then later, when he's talking to Wendy, say, oh, no, I didn't see anything in there. Like, either there was nothing in there, or there was. Um, and people always just sort of take that scene as, at face value. I don't know why, but, you know, this is yet another example of that. I don't understand it, but, you know, again, I'm not going to criticize that too much here. Um, she's, she does not see everything the audience has seen and is only working with what she knows. Okay, so Catatonic Danny tells her, allegedly, that there's a crazy woman in room 237. Okay. Let, let's just keep it moving. I want to get through this essay. Uh, Wendy is herself actually a victim of the audience's misogyny. She so grates them with her disregard for what they want her to be that in retaliation they perceive her as a weak victim deserving of abuse. Okay. Again, I've shown this movie to a lot of people. I mean a lot of people. None of them have ever said Wendy deserves Jack's treatment. None of them. I mean, l listen. When that scene with the stairs and the Colorado Lounge happens, every time I've screened this movie for several, several groups of people, in some cases they would cheer when Wendy would bop him over the head with the baseball bat. And they'd be like, finally she does something. Finally she gives him what he's what he deserves. You know, to be bopped upside the head with a baseball bat. Um, so I don't know about this. Because this is not what I've experienced uh, in, in, sh in showing this movie to people. They root for Wendy. More or less throughout the whole movie. They root for Wendy. Like there is very little, if any, sympathy for the Jack character when I've shown this movie to people. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Um, so that's why I have like trouble with this personally. But not, I'm not having trouble with the writer's perception here because this is the commonly accepted viewing and interpretation of that. And it's commonly accepted for a whole bunch of reasons. But again, in my experience showing this movie to people, they root for Wendy. They love it when she hits Jack on the head with the with the baseball bat. They love it when he when they see the picture of him frozen to death in the maze. They say, well, he 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 got what he was looking for. That's what he deserves. You know, that is the odd when I've shown it, the audience's reaction to that. I'm just saying. Okay, let me take a little coffee break and hold up. Oh yeah, there's a lot more of this to read. <laughs> Am I going to get through all... Is this going to have to be a two-parter? My God. I don't know. Maybe. 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 Hold on. Um, mm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to think about some stuff. Um, I'm, let, let me take a little break and think about this. Hold on. Okay, I'm back. Um, and I've taken a look at this during my coffee break and I think I will finish this today, but I'm going to skip over this part, Altman's Millie Lemoreau and Kubrick's Wendy. So she's comparing, I think, these two characters, 
um, in the movie Alt Robert Altman's Three Women. Um, and I'm going to, just for the sake of time, uh, because I'm not trying to kind of concentrate on that right now, you can definitely read this in your own time, this section on Altman's Millie Lamoureux and Kubrick's Wendy. I'm going to skip over this and go right to how the misogyny of the audience affects their view of Kubrick's Wendy, Wendy's behavior. Does she really spend the majority of the film crying and screaming? But before I do that, let me read this last paragraph of this of this part, um, and then we'll keep it moving. Uh, Wendy is herself actually a victim of the audience's misogyny. She so grates them with her disregard for what they want her to be that in retaliation they perceive her as a weak victim deserving of abuse. Again, I've explained that when I've shown this movie to people, they cheer Wendy. They cheer for Wendy, they root for her, they cheer when she bops him on the head, and they cheer when they see Jack get lost in the maze and then frozen to death in the maze at the end. I'm just saying. Um... As stated in the quote-unquote preliminary section, it was only in 1978 the United States formed the National Coalition Against, uh, Against Domestic Violence, along with the first battered women's program in opening in North Carolina. Women were often blamed for their abuse, as with children. Uh, they had brought it on themselves. They were too demanding. They were whiny. They were shrill. They wanted money their partners couldn't provide. They demanded a quality of attention their partners couldn't provide after a hard day's work. They didn't shoulder their own responsibilities. They might not have made dinner or cleaned the house. They were irritating. They were even wimpy dishrags and thus demanded abuse through a fundamental flaw in their personalities, practically begging for it. None of these things are reasons for any form of abuse. We, What we have is a litany of victim blaming. Curiously, Wendy is described by irritated audience members as possessing many of the qualities and thus, and being thus worthy of abuse. Later I will show how she, she doesn't even possess these characteristics frequently attributed to her. Now this whole paragraph that Julie Kearns wrote here, I mean, she says audiences. You know, I mean, the person that, again, my audiences, when I've shown this movie, complete opposite. You know, yeah, they, they laugh at Wendy sometimes, but when she, again, they root for her too. They cheer her on and in combating uh, Jack's abusive behavior. Again, in the traditional reading or watching of the movie. When she hits him on the head, they, they cheer. When he gets, when they see his frozen corpse, they are delighted. All right. Now, what she's writing in this paragraph, she's talking about maybe one particular audience member. Sneezy. Stevie the Snowman. You know? Uh, he's the one that, I mean, maybe she's uncovering his misogyny. He's the one that accuses Stanley Kubrick of being a misogynist. But all of this that she said, this is this is more or less a pretty good characterization of his reaction to, the, uh, to Kubrick's Wendy. He's basically saying she deserves the way she's being treated by Jack. She's whiny, she screams, she, she's a dish rag. Hmm. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. And again, the audience that I've shown this to, both men and women, <clears throat> definitely do not believe that Wendy deserves to be abused just because she's annoying. Nope. Nope. But okay, that, that's that. Let me skip over this Altman's Millie's Lamoureux part, and then let me go on down to this, how the misogyny of the audience affects their view of Kubrick's Wendy's behavior. Does she really spend the majority of the film crying and screaming? Uh, society's role for Wendy in the 1970s was to remain with her husband and believe and hope that she had quit, that he had quit drinking and that his injury of Danny was an unfortunate accident caused by his drinking. When Jack decides to carry his family up to the Overlook, her role was to be supportive. She doesn't have the foresight of the audience. She doesn't know this is a horror film. Well, okay. Uh, she knows it's a horror life that she's living. So, you know, whatever. Um, Kubrick and Shelley give us a woman having to deal with a complex range of emotions. She is far from pathetic, a woman of strength and independence. But as her situation is uncertain, 
throughout most of the film she is denied the secure confidence of irrefragable conclusions and response the audience decries her for staying with her abusive husband when she's dealing with the situation as as would many women of that era and even today she is judged for staying with jack when at the time she would have been judged also for leaving and not giving him another chance she is judged for not standing up to him though she does she is said to be stupid that she whines a lot she is judged for her tears stephen king said she was just a screaming dishrag the attitude when its attitude toward wendy is as above is absolutely misogynistic and yet such critics say the film is I, again i think i know what julie is, is saying here you know stephen king himself says she's a screaming dishrag and that because of that more or less she she deserves to be treated badly again in the way i'm looking at this movie and the way i'm analyzing this movie personally i think stanley kubrick is exposing the living shit out of stephen king and and stephen king's misogyny his hatred of women because this is what he had to say about the wendy character the way it was portrayed by shelley duvall in stanley kubrick's movie That's 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 how Sneezy feels about it. Now, whether or not the average viewer of this movie feels the way, um, you know, that Julie is describing here, I don't know. Maybe at the time, maybe in the seventies, but you know, abuse is abuse, and you know, I've known some women who were abused in my life, and the male response to that abuse was not sympathetic to the husband the male response to that abuse was you know how could he how could he do that to his wife how could he hit his wife how could he give his wife a black eye what kind of piece of shit is he to allow himself to behave that way like who does he think he is putting his hands on a woman like that especially the his wife and the mother of his children like Mm. you know men are critical of other men when they behave that way contrary to popular belief i don't know why everybody thinks that men are all one kind of like monolithic um entity and they all think the same way about everything that's not fair That's what that's the reason why I, you know, usually say I'm not saying this from a woman's perspective. I'm saying this from Miss M's perspective because I can't speak for all women. Same thing. Like one man cannot speak for all the men on planet Earth, all the men in America. No. And I was like, I was talking like um, the DC Rai uh, song that I posted in the community page uh, by the Melvins that would you know uh gershom turned me on to that and gershom <laughs> um thank you so much because like I, that's one of my favorite songs now i love it i've listened to i've listened to it a couple of times since you since you showed me that but uh, buzz osborne is jewish and so is stanley kubrick but buzz i remember reading an interview with buzz osborne and he was talking about like the music industry and like i think all of the unsavory characters in the music business and he said buzz Os this is buzz buzz Os uh, buzz osborne of the melvins talking here he said uh there's an old jewish saying he says uh buzz osborne says he there's an old jewish saying that says never ever trust a man who cheats on his wife that's coming from buzz um and i mean i i'll just go ahead and take his word for it that that's a, that's an old jewish thing and that shit makes sense because like if if somebody if a man is prepared to deceive the woman that he took a vow to love and protect and whatever before god and before all their friends and family and you know in the wedding ceremony if he's prepared to deceive her and cheat on her that way like what is he gonna do to you 
Yeah, his partner in life, his wife and the mother of his children, if he's prepared to treat her that way, how is he prepared to treat everybody else? Okay, so not all men are like on board with this shit. Not now, and I don't believe like ever. Yeah, unfortunately, culturally, culturally, like people have been taught to mind their own business when they see signs or evidence of abuse. And a lot of times people don't want to believe it. A lot of times people don't want to believe that spousal abuse is going on because it's horrifying. It's hard to even think about that. Yeah, it happens, but, you know, people are, they don't want to wrap their mind around that horror, especially if it's somebody that they know and they respect. But never mind all that. Um, yeah, again, I don't think that all men feel the way that Stephen King does. I really don't. And I think, again, Stanley Kubrick is exposing the shit out of Stephen King and possibly all the men who are like him, who are misogynists and who do think like that. That's my take on this. Um, and Julie continues, does Wendy whine and scream a lot? How does her character actually behave? Watch the film again. Her first scene, the day of the interview, interview, she is reading an intellectual, not a trash novel, and simply taking care of Danny, having fed him. When he expresses doubts about going to the Overlook, she gives him reassurance that things will be fine. Her next scene is when Jack calls, and she is enthusiastic about his having gotten the job. Then Danny has his seizure, and we have a scene with the doctor. Shelley is dealing with what she knows, and what she knows is Jack is alcoholic, and that Danny was injured by him when he was drinking. She is nervous when telling the doctor about this, because she knows this sounds bad. She is also the woman who is having to act and hope as though everything she's been told for some months is true that jack is sober that jack wouldn't hurt danny again that she should accept what she is told at face value such as that jack's hurting danny was purely accidental and as long as he's not drinking then it will not happen again so though the past is troubling the fact jack has been sober that long would give her cautious reason for hope they have a child, and she is trying to hold the family together to be its stable center. She is an anxious mother concerned both for her son and their survival as a family. No whining, no crying, no screaming. The next scenes with Wendy are all on the day they go move up to the Overlook. What does Wendy do? Jack is largely silent while Wendy pulls out the social face, expressing appreciation for the hotel, and is the one exhibiting intellectual curiosity, asking questions about the decorations and when the hotel was built. She strides ahead of Jack in most scenes. I've pointed that out to you. She strides ahead of Jack in most scenes. No, not most scenes, Julie. All of them. Um, in, in, the, in the closing day scenes, she's always in front of Jack. It's always Allman, Wendy, Jack, Watson. Always. Um, comfortably dialoguing with Allman and later Dick Halloran. No whining, no crying, no screaming. A month later, she takes breakfast to Jack. No whining, no screaming, no badgering. She lightheartedly plays in the maze with Danny. No whining, no crying, no screaming. Next, we have the Tuesday section. After watching the news while preparing dinner, she goes to tell Jack a big storm is coming. No whining, no crying, no whining, no screaming, no badgering. Who starts yelling? He does. He starts screaming at her. She doesn't whine. She is instead stunned. Life apparently has been fine thus far at the Overlook because her reaction indicates his rage is out of the blue. Oh, okay. Uh, but she's also familiar with this kind of rage, too. She's lived with this before. And she doesn't know what is acceptable in regards Jack's behavior to her. She is a woman who no longer knows this is absolutely unacceptable. And as I said, she's also stunned because life has been decent there thus far. I understand where Julie's coming from here, but again, these are assumptions. We don't know how life has been thus far. We haven't seen anything. I mean, we've seen a little bit, but we haven't seen it all. We haven't seen it all. Um... So, I mean, again, the nature of the way that scene is filmed, that one in particular, where she comes in and tells him it's going to snow and whatever, there's like several things about that scene that just don't make a no sense. 
And why don't they make sense? Stanley made them not make sense for a reason. That's how I feel. But I understand what Julie is trying to um, express here. Uh, the audience could say she had the warning shot across the bow right there. She should have packed up and gone. What a dishrag for not doing so. She could have, but then we wouldn't have a film. <laughs> I guess so. Uh, the next scene with her is Thursday. She is outside in the snowstorm, lightheartedly playing with Danny. No whining, no crying, no no screaming. Saturday, Wendy is the responsible one who is doing all the work at the hotel. Finding the phone lines are out due the storm, she calls the forestry service. She has a pleasant conversation with a ranger. She is obviously wishing for some conversation. I am thinking that when she escapes from the overlook, she ought to get together... <laughs> with the forest ranger i have some comments about that in future videos stay tuned uh part 17 or 18 stay tuned uh they could have a love connection there's no whining no crying no screaming monday wendy watches television with danny no whining no crying no screaming wednesday taking care of the hotel's boilers wendy hears jack yelling and runs to help him does he ever help her with a damn thing no uh, finding him coming out of a nightmare, she tries to solace him. He tells her a terrible dream he's had of killing her and Danny. Danny then appears with the strangulation marks on his neck, suddenly reverting also to an infantile state. Wendy gets appropriately furious at Jack, believing he had done this, calls him a son of a bitch, and runs off with Danny to take care of him. No whining, no screaming. She does yell at Jack. That is not hysterical screaming. Then after this, for the first time, we see her crying when she runs to tell Jack that Danny has told her there's a crazy woman in the hotel with them and that it was this crazy bathtub woman who strangled him. We are an hour and nine minutes into this film. These are her first tears. This, These are all good observations, I gotta say. Uh, she is more breathless than anything else. She is, of course, partly reassured that Jack hasn't hurt Danny, but terrified by the prospect of this intruder. Mm, I have some thoughts about this, but now is not the time. Uh, she can only take at face value the intruder exists. Jack tells her she's crazy. Thanks, Jack. Uh, next we see her. She is anxious in their apartment, waiting for Jack to return, after looking for the crazy woman. She doesn't know what in the world to think when Jack insists there is no such woman. Jack tells her Danny strangled himself, and now she starts getting upset. She's dealing not only with a child who has been assaulted and is catatonic. Jack is trying to convince her that Danny strangled himself. Sensibly, she insists they take Danny down the mountain. She cries, but is primarily stunned when Jack blows up at her refusing to get help for Danny, accusing her of ruining his life. He storms out. We are one hour and twenty minutes into the film. She sits crying on the bed, wondering what in the hell to do now. Because she's crying and sniffling, I suppose some will say she's sniveling. Okay. When we next see her, when Danny speaks to her in the voice of Tony and tells her Danny has gone away, she cries. Who can blame her? Thursday morning. Mm -hmm. Okay, Thursday morning. An hour and 40 minutes into this movie, Wendy is not crying, sitting with Danny for whom she's made breakfast. She goes then to find Jack, sensibly taking along a baseball bat. She appro she's appropriately horrified when she discovers Jack has been crazily typing. All work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. Jack is not only still in crazy mode, he's become even more obviously unhinged and hostile. <sighs> okay. She holds that bat tight as she tells Jack she wants to get Danny down to a doctor. He arguing against it, arguing she doesn't care about his responsibilities. She's aware he could possibly kill her right now and is simply trying to get away. She's crying, yes. She's begging her husband to not be insane, basically. Begging him to let her go, to not hurt her. She ably defends herself by not trying to run or hit him with the bat until she's got a good shot at disabling him. She uses the bat at first to just keep him away from her, ably not letting him grab it. When he does make a move to seize it finally at the top of the stairs, she whacks him on the head, and he tumbles down the steps, out of commission. Guess what Stephen King's heroine doesn't manage to do? <laughs> Jack in the novel thwacks Wendy all over with a mallet before she finally manages to stab him, which doesn't stop him. Kubik's heroine 
may be crying, but she's in one piece, not broken to bits, and unable to walk. When she drags Jack into the storage room, safely now assured she doesn't know he's going to escape, her love and concern for him are still obvious. She has not only to be terrified of him, but terrified for him. First and foremost, she's going to get help for Danny, but she's also going to get help for Jack at that point. Jack begs her to let him out, but she knows better than to do that. She cries over, she cries some over this horrible situation as she tells Jack she's going down the mountain with Danny. Then she learns that he sabotaged the snowcat. She stops crying. She grabs a knife because she's smart. She runs out to the snowcat and finds Jack was true to his word, and she and Danny are stuck. Thursday, early evening, Wendy's resting, confident that Jack is locked up with plenty of food. Not so. He arrives with an axe. She cries out once as he chops the apartment's door, then locks herself in the bathroom with Danny. No tears. She's trying to take care of Danny. She gets Danny out that window. Only when Danny's out the window... Does she start screaming as Jack continues axing now through the bathroom door? We are two hours and three minutes into the film. This is the first scene in which she is screaming. Then, when Jack reaches in to unlock the door, she slashes his hand with a knife. They hear Halloran arriving. She is quiet. Jack is quiet. Jack leaves. So, Wendy doesn't start screaming until we're two hours and three minutes into the movie. At two hours and four minutes, Halloran arrives. That's about one minute of screaming. Oh, when Wendy goes to find Danny, she doesn't scream when she sees the apparition of the man in the costume. She doesn't scream when she sees Halloran dead. She doesn't scream when the man with the bloodied head then appears behind her. She screams once again when she comes again upon the lobby, and it is filled with skeletons. That is her last scream. She doesn't scream upon seeing the blood flowing from the elevators. At the end of the film, Wendy gets Danny in the snowcat and drives away. People say that in Kubrick's film, Wendy has no agency in rescuing herself and Danny, whereas in the book she does. No, in the book, Wendy is beaten to bits with the mallet, stabs Jack, he keeps going, not dead yet, but remembers the boilers and goes down to try to deal with them. Halloran picks Wendy up and carries her outside the hotel as she's unable to walk, Danny accompanying, and the hotel blows Jack up. In Kubrick's film, Wendy keeps herself from being injured, whacks Jack, locks him up. When Jack gets free and pursues them with the axe, she saves Danny by getting him out the bathroom window, etc., etc., happens, the maze happens, and then Wendy rides away with Danny in Halloran's snowcat. My point, my point being that Wendy does not spend the majority of the film screaming. She only screams when Jack is axing the bathroom door, and a couple of times after that. She's right. Julia's right about all of this. That Now, again, she seems to be addressing, or it, she might as well be addressing, Stephen King's comments about the movie and about the Wendy character. She's doing this... You know, again, she might or she might as well be doing this to shut Stephen King up because he needs to shut up. He really does. Uh, but anyway, wrapping it up. Oh, dear. Let's see how much of this there is. OK, wrapping it up. Uh, Stephen King ha, 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 did start out with a strong story of alcoholism, anger and abuse in The Shining, but then absolved Jack of agency and culpability with a paranormal evil being responsible for all his actions at the hotel. That's interesting. That is interesting. Like, she's really, truly right about this. None of the, none of the shit Jack in the novel does is Jack's fault. It's because he's tormented by spirits. Mm. That's really interesting. Um, anyway, let me keep it moving. And Wendy at the hotel came also to see herself not as battling Jack for her life, but the hotel. No confusion, no uncertainty. If King's evil hotel was intended to serve as an allegory for alcoholism, suggesting that Jack's alcoholically fueled rage was a disease distinct from himself, Kubrick has in their Boulder apartment Sontag's illness as metaphor, which examined the falsehood of identifying the victims of such diseases as cancer and tuberculosis with the disease, it both succeeded and failed. Separating Jack the man from his abusive actions 
approaching those actions as a disease over which he had no control. If the book is an allegory for this, then King succeeds, at least from his point of view, in separating a pure Jack from a disease-possessed Jack, which absolves him of responsibility for his actions. Ooh, there's a lot to unpack with that statement, but whatever. Uh, the separation of Jack from the disease is partially carried out by Jack not even drinking at the hotel. The alcoholism is instead a paranormal operation in which alcohol can be smelled, though none is physically present, none is physically present, and Jack behaving as one drunk even though he had not dr he, he's not had a drink. Mm hmm. Something about that, though. Something about that. Uh, Kubrick was always interested in the problem of choice and free will. Uh, as versus mechanical doom, and King pretty much divorces Jack from free agency by virtue of his possession. Jack carried no blame for his actions, but with this we enter into a tricky philosophical area, and the book fails the victim of abuse as it deals the abuser a get-out-of-jail-free card, even as abuse as disease destroys themselves and those abused. King, a practicing alcoholic at the time he wrote The Shining, didn't quit drinking until around 1989, and the Stephen King of an interview in 2004 is a different King from the one who wrote The Shining. I beg to differ, but whatever. Uh, here's a quote uh, from a 2014 Rolling Stone interview, I guess from Stephen King. Uh, I believe in evil, but all my life I've gone back and forth about whether or not there is an outside evil, whether or not there is a force in the world that really wants to destroy us from the inside out, individually and collectively, or whether it all comes from inside and, that's, and that it's all part of genetics and environment. The older I get, the less I think there is some sort of outside devilish influence. It comes from people, and unless we are able to address that issue sooner or later, we'll fucking kill ourselves. Okay. All right. I don't know quite what to think, but I'm not here to do that now. Um, I'm not here to think about this now. Uh, the King of 1978 has Jack possessed by an external evil. Decades later, in King's sequel to The Shining, there is still a paranormal, ter paranormal evil, but Danny himself, an alcoholic, has found AA and doesn't drink, and the assumption is that had his father been able to quit drinking, his life would have been different. There are circumstances of environment and genetics that go into the making of an alcoholic, and these aren't denied. Even AA holds that some few are constitutionally incapable of getting off alcohol. The issues surrounding alcoholism and addiction are highly nuanced, and even if the disease is separated from the person so they aren't culpable, there remains the solid known that if you don't drink, then you won't get drunk. Uh... I bring all of this up as the abuser often blames the victim, just as the misogynist blames women for their misogyny. Uh-huh. Um, <clears throat> and whether or not the Jack of the Shining was responsible for his actions, Wendy and Danny are both still his victims, uh, still the victims of the abuser's blame game and gaslighting, which is also addressed in AA through the alcoholic making amends, when possible, and not harmful, an action not done for one's ego. Okay. Um, Kubrick gives us a story that, for the majority of it, can be interpreted as wholly psychological, but in the end, we are likely to accept that supernatural elements are at work. However, this confidence isn't had until the end, and for all practical purposes, doesn't ever enter with Wendy in her dealings with Jack. Hmm... There was the question in the movie of fate versus free will, but Cooper keeps Wendy in the territory of judicially definable and law definable and lawfully guilty. Yes, you are. Oh, wait a minute. Let me read this again. There is the question in the movie of fate versus free will, but Kubrick keeps Wendy in the territory of judicially definable and lawfully, quote, guilty. Yes, you are, end quote, unless disqualified due clinical insanity. 
domestic abuse so that she is fighting Jack rather than the hotel, and Jack is responsible for murdering Halloran, and is responsible for his attempts to kill his wife and son. Kubrick's tweak of the material gives the impression that, even with and as regards an external evil, Dan and Halloran were aware of it and not seduced, whereas Jack's bitterness and desire for absolute control over Wendy and Danny made him susceptible to its influence. In dialogue with Lloyd, he never questions his own feelings as he vented them. In dialogue with Grady, Grady was able to convince him that Danny and Wendy were problems which had to be controlled in the most rigorous way. Grady arguing for such conviction talks past Jack's doubts and confusion, his uncertainty. There was the possibility of another path to be taken, and that oh, other path was examined and denied. Jack, already speaking of the white man's burden, before taking his first drink at the hotel, already emotionally abusing Wendy, chooses to succumb to his bitterness and his anger when he first when he first says, "Here's to five miserable months on the wagon and all the irreparable harm it's caused me," then takes his imaginary drink. He accepts his misogyny when he says, "There's just a little problem with the old sperm bank upstairs." He fully acquiesces to and accepts his racism, in his dialogue with Grady. In a 2011 interview, Shelley Duvall had the following to say of her character. Mm, okay, let's read it. Uh, there were there were af they were after a tall actress with common housewife looks. Okay. Uh, Stanley really gets a bad reputation, but he was a perfectionist. We had our moments when we laughed and joked around on set, but then there were times that we just exploded at each other. I'm a very stubborn person and don't like being bossed around and told what to do. Stanley pushed and pushed to get the performance out of me that he wanted. The script wasn't really specific enough for me to understand what my character was going through mentally. I played it out as a battered but loving housewife who supports her husband through all the shit in their marriage. Stanley wanted a tough, strong, independent woman. I disagreed with that decision. But the way all my scenes worked out, you see all those emotions in my character. What I thought my character should be, and what he thought my character should be, rolled into one. It was a hell of a shoot, but he got what he wanted out of me. Ay, 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 this is interesting. This is interesting. Shelley Duvall does not sound like she was being treated poorly by Stanley Kubrick. She argued with him. You don't argue with your boss. Like, ever. I mean, maybe some of us do. I do not. I don't. This, I, I, I'm not willing to take that risk personally. But um, she did. She said they laughed and joked around on set, but there were times when they just exploded at each other. And she's, an, she's a stubborn person, doesn't like being bossed around and told what to do. And Stanley pushed to get the performance that he wanted. Um, and she says here, Stanley wanted a tough, strong, independent woman. And she disagreed with that. Shelley Duvall disagreed with that. Okay, put that in your Pipe and smoke it, Stephen King. Misogynistic. Mm. Yeah, Stephen King does not get the movie. Or his own book, in my opinion. Anyway, let me keep it moving. Shelley perceives Kubrick's Wendy as having manifested with manifested both the qualities that she and Kubrick felt she should portray. The battered and supportive loving wife, as well as the tough, strong, independent woman. All the qualities which I see and were a complex mix. If Kubrick wanted the tough, strong, independent woman, and audiences responded to that portrayal instead as misogynistic, viewing Wendy instead as whiny and unintelligent and begging for abuse, then was Kubrick the one who was so very wrong, or did he, as I've conjectured in the first couple of sections, intentionally bring to the surface the audience's sexism and misogyny? Hmm... Mm. So basically, Julie Kearns feels that like Stanley Kubrick did a number on his audience. Ooh. Maybe. 
Let me finish this thing. When we review the footage as I've done above, and see how little screaming time she has in the film, and that she communicates all the qualities Shelley and Kubrick discuss, what are we to make of perceptions of her being a vapid hysteric who only merits disdain? This is Jack's perception of Wendy. Crazy Jack, who the audience accepts as being abusive and yet doesn't stand back and realize when hostile towards Wendy, they are accepting and also venting the same hostility as had by Jack in all his misogyny. I wish, I wish Julie would, would, you know, she's talking about Jack. Jack is a fictional character. And I mean, Jack's misogyny, if it's there, okay, it's there. I mean, this is not the way I look at the movie, but the traditional viewing of this movie, yeah, Jack would be the misogynist. But again, she's not ignoring Stephen King's comments, but she's kind of glossing over them. She's, you know, she's, she's calling Jack the fictional character, a misogynist. How about the man who wrote that character? How about the man who called Shelley Duvall's portrayal of Wendy as she, he said, all she does is, is scream and yell and she's like a big old dish rag. Those are Stephen King's words. Not Stanley Kubrick's. Not Jack Nicholson's. And not even Jack Torrance's in the movie. That's Stephen King. Saying that all she did was scream and act stupid. I'm just saying. Uh, Kirk Douglas, at the end of Paths of Glory, in his expression of pained revulsion for the community of soldiers abusing the quote-unquote enemy female, is the yardstick that lets the audience know that rather than embracing this overwhelming misogyny, they are to recognize it as degrading, that the soldiers now humiliate and deprive her of her humanity, just as they had been deprived of their own by the elite. Over the years, with The Shining, an appreciative audience for Shelley's depiction of Wendy has grown, but just as in 1980, there are still those who only see her as eminently abusable, not recognizing they are Jack's fellow community of soldiers abusing the quote-unquote enemy woman and placing the fault on her for that abuse, their perceptions of her warped by that hostility. If they would argue that Kubrick's and Shelley's Wendy is the one responsible for these feelings, my return argument is that they are not only viewers of the story, they are the story of the horrifying abuse that stalks Wendy through the Colorado Lounge. Okay. Again, I partially agree with her, but partially I don't, because again, the audience is is Stanley doing a number on the audience, especially like the male uh, members of the audience. I don't know. I don't know. Is he doing? But you know, again, I think he's especially doing a number on Stephen King. Stephen King is the one who's had all those negative, nasty things to say about the Wendy character as portrayed by Shelley Duvall. And he says she's a misogynist character. No. She's not a misogynist character. Your reaction to her is misogynist, Stephen. You're the one who thinks that just because she behaves however we see her behave in the movie, that means that, like Julie is saying here, that she's earned her abuse. That's what Stephen King is saying. That she runs around and yells and acts stupid. And she's a dish rag. So. Does that mean if a, if a woman acts stupid in real life and she gets treated badly that she deserves it? Or if she, you know, she acts the way Wendy acts in this movie, she deserves to be treated badly? Is that what Stephen King is saying? As opposed to his version of Wendy in his book who looks like where's that picture uh Rebecca de Mornay this woman does not deserve to be abused but this woman does um excuse me is that what he's saying is that what Stevie the snowman sneezy is saying ay 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 I don't know what to think, y'all. I just don't know what to think. 
I mean, you know, I, I can, I appreciate what Julie Kearns is trying to do in this essay. I don't totally agree with her. I just don't, but, and I've, I've kind of highlighted what parts, uh, where I don't agree with her. And again, this essay is based on the traditional kind of, uh, the traditional way that people watch this movie and interpret this movie. I have a problem with that traditional way of interpreting this movie. I think there is a serious, unreliable narrator thing going on. And there are many things that people have not noticed about this movie. Uh, that, and probably plenty of things that are yet to be noticed by anybody. Um, you know, like I, my, I mean, Julie, you know, I, I'm open to a discussion with you. Uh, one of my, uh, one of my theories, should I call it that? I don't know, is that the Overlook Hotel is not an ordinary hotel. I believe that it is a brothel, a house of prostitution. Okay, and that's what we're looking at. And that's what basically Stuart Ullman is, a pimp who manages a hotel that exists solely for the purpose of that of, of serving that kind of industry. That's how what I believe. Also, I've noticed the vents in in the Colorado Lounge, especially the Colorado Lounge, but in some other places too. No, I as far as I know, I'm the only person who's noticed those. So far. Those in the Colorado Lounge, especially those vents mean something. Something important. The Wendy character, what is up with her? Should we take her at face value? I don't know. J the Jack character in the movie, should we take him at face value? I don't know. I do believe that Stanley Kubrick did a number on his audience. I do believe maybe maybe the number that Stephen, not Stephen, no, Stanley Kubrick did on his audience includes challenging their potential misogyny. Maybe. Possibly. And another one of my, like, theories is that S Stanley Kubrick is exposing the living shit out of Stephen King. I, I believe that Stanley Kubrick did not like that man. And that's probably one of the reasons why he agreed to do this movie. That's just my, that's just how I feel. But y'all, I, I got through this. Yes, I skipped this whole part about the Robert Altman movie. Um, but again, I'm already past two hours. If I had included that part, whoo, I've never made a three hour video, but like, there's always a first time for everything. So you guys, um, let me focus on that beautiful picture of Shelley Duvall. Okay. This woman does not get the respect or the recognition that she deserves as an actress or, or anything. Okay. All people talk about is how she's lost her mind and how, you know, Stanley Kubrick abused her. No, he did not abuse her. They had what seems like a pretty good relationship, a pretty healthy relationship between uh, a boss and an employer. That's, that's rare. You don't, you, you don't argue with your boss. At least most of us don't. She did. And, you know, she, she still respects him and he respected her and he respected her as an actress. No, Stanley Kubrick was not a misogynist. Stephen King, on the other hand, mm -mm. no, 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 no. So anyway, you guys, I'm done with this. I'm done with this article. Pretty good article. Pretty good essay. Even though I don't agree with the whole thing. But y'all let me know in the comments what you think. If you made it this far in the video. If you've been listening to me for this long. God bless you. <laughs> you guys are awesome. Um, <clears throat> You know, uh, I will go ahead and wrap it up pretty soon. I'm going to be, again, debunking the debunkers with, with our friend. David here and his artwork. Uh, I'm sick and tired of being told that I can't think what I want to think about something because it goes against the established, um, you know, uh, uh, accepted way of doing it. No, no. So look out for that. That might be my next video. Still working on part 17. Stay tuned for that. Thank you, Julie Kearns, for writing this essay. And thank you, Julie Kearns, for doing this wonderful website. It really is quite something. So, y'all, I think I'm done for now. Um, 
And that's that. Put it in the comments, whatever you have to say about this or related issues. I can't wait to read it. Um, and that's that. I'll redo the church announcements. Returning viewers, thank you for returning. New viewers, thank you for being new. Subscribers, thank you for subscri subscribing. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share the video. Spread it far and wide. And that's that. So, y'all, until next time, until the next video where I find yet another reason to talk at you, I'm going to go ahead and bid you bye-bye. So, bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>